Bible study from se selected verses from Proverbs 19. Three decisions everybody needs to make from Proverbs 19. Decisions are important because decisions give direction in your life. If you look at every turning point you have ever experienced looking back over your life, you will notice that that turning point was created by some sort of, sort of decision that you have made. Some decisions give groundbreaking direction. Let's say for instance I'm driving north and then I decide to turn west. Whenever you decide to turn, turn west, uh, that is a major decision in your life with a major change in your life. And you can equate that to the big decisions in life that has to do with what work do you do who do you choose for a partner where are you going to stay those decisions are influenced are influencing the ultimate results in your life and will directly relate to your sense of happiness your sense of fulfillment and whether you are living your calling from God then decisions also help us to make certain adjustments. Let's say for instance I am on my way to Durban and then there's a crosswind blowing me from course. Then the autopilot constantly makes small adjustments in the sense where it will still meet its destination. And living is a lot like that. Once you've made the major decisions of what you want from life, how you want to live it, and where you are going, then you need to constantly make adjustments in order to achieve it. But this is the question. What is your guideline for making these adjustments? And then, before every first step, there is a mental process. And that mental process is a process of deciding. Sometimes it is a very conscious decision where you weigh the pros and cons. Other times it is more instinctively, I want to go that way or I just want to do that or that is the easier way or that is the best option available to me. Proverbs 19 helps us make these type of decisions. The first decision from Proverbs 19 verse 1. I will choose to be better. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. We have noticed that Proverbs likes comparisons. This is a strange comparison, however, because the two issues opposing each other is not directly related. You can be a person with integrity or you can be a person whose lips are perverse. This is a comparison of character. Being poor or being wealthy is not the real issue. What is missing in this comparison is the idea that a better character will bring wealth. There is no direct comparison like this. What this proverb is saying is that to have a better character is much more important than having the best circumstances in life. Your character is determined by what you value. Your highest value will ultimately become your God. Let's take this for instance. What Take something that is important for you and then you say I will exchange that for, let's say for instance, my work is important to me. And then you say, I will exchange that for, I will exchange that for health. So that means I will stop doing the work I'm doing now and I will take another work. Why? Because it is important to my health. So now your health is of a higher value. You will exchange your health for it's a bit difficult 
But some people will exchange the health for their family. They will work themselves to be in ill health in order to provide better for their family. And so you can take that a bit further and a bit further until you reach the single thing in your life that you are not willing to trade for anything. And that thing will become your God. That thing will determine your decisions. For believers, the highest value is to serve the living God in His kingdom. What you value will determine your future. Think about Yesa. Yesa gave up his good character for immediate satisfaction. So he gave away his rights. Why? In order to be fulfilled in the immediate. So in actual fact, he exchanged his whole future and the future of his children and their children for this moment's satisfaction from hunger. This principle is also living in people around us today. You can just think on some examples where people are trading their future for something immediate. Let's say, for instance, I really w want to lose weight. And now I'm trading this future of being a healthier me for this McDonald's, this Wimpy, this Coke. I'm trading, uh, I'm trading my future with the way I use my money. I'm trading my future in the way... I handle relationships. Proverbs is very clear that character is better than immediate relationships. But we need to say why. Character is better because of permanence. Permanence is an aspect on your character that says that is the way you are. You will be and act and think and value in any circumstances. Let's take places. You will be yourself whether you stay in Cape Town, whether you stay in Jamestown, whether you stay in Pretoria, whether you stay in Durban. You will still be yourself. Character has got that sense of permanence. Your character will stay the same in better circumstances or in difficult circumstances. There is this idea in, 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 in character that it is the way that you know yourself and the way that other people know you and in that way they can predict how you are to act in certain circumstances. Why? Because there is a sense of permanence in your character. And you can write down, what are the two, three things that your friends say about you? Or what are the, those things that you say about yourself that will lead you to examine and discover this is what makes my character permanent? Maybe it is that I always like to joke. Maybe it is that I will be the quiet one. Maybe it is that I will always try to be deep or find a better sense of meaning. Maybe it is because I like to make a joke about stuff. What is it in your character that is permanent? Then character gives a sense of pervasiveness where in tough times you need to rely on something. What is it in your character that carries you through tough times? It might be strong decision taking. We say, I have taken this decision and I will follow this path until this passes. It might be 
just strength of will. I want to do this and I want to finish it and I want to. Pervasiveness is extremely important because it gives you the resilience you need to meet challenges. It gives you this resilience to meet when negative th things happen because none of our lives always works out exactly as we want it to be. So it is very important that we grow and cultivate a character that is pervasive. Think on a person you know that doesn't have the strong character, that constantly changes their character whether they are in this situation or in situation B or in situation D or in situation F the chameleon-like character. There is no pervasiveness in it and therefore it will create a certain type of future that is dependent on how the circumstances changes and not on how the character works in the circumstances. Always remember that from the beginning in Genesis 1 Man was called to live with God's way within circumstances, in the good and the bad circumstances, to take care of and to guide and to influence the circumstances. We are not supposed to have the circumstances determine our character. And then character is the best predictor of a future. You can think in this way, that what you have today is the result of the previous character you had. Because character governs the way you make decisions, governs the way that you respond to circumstances. And character is the one line that connects all the important dots, all the important events in your life. If you write your life down and say, that's that was an important in grade 2, and that was important in grade 12, and that was important after school, and that was important when I was young, and that was important when I first got married, and that was important, and then you connect all those important events, the line you are drawing will give you a picture of your character that will show you the permanence and the pervasiveness of your character and that is the best predictor of the future that you will have. The way of the perverse tongue is an attitude where you try to manipulate reality by creating a false view of reality. In simple terms, it is the way people lie to themselves and the way people lie to the world. The first type of lie is straight out. It's not connected to any reality. It is just something I thought of. It is just some fantasy. It is just something I might want to believe or that I believe but there's no evidence in reality for that belief. And don't be fooled. Every one of us do have these irrational beliefs that is not founded in reality of life or in the reality of Christ. Another way we like to bend reality is like those mirrors at the circuit, uh, those mirrors at the circus, where they make some elements smaller or they make other elements bigger. So we tend to make our own mistakes and our own faults in our own version of what happens, sometimes smaller. Why? We want to protect ourselves and we want to protect uh, ourselves from judgment or from shaming. In another sense, we would like to tell some other story where we would like to be the hero and make our own role in it much bigger than it actually was. Then, of course, there's a lie of silence. When you know you had to speak, but you are keeping silent. We 
need to know why people lie. Because when we know why people lie, we can address it within ourselves. And remember, this lie is the trade-off. This lie shows what is your highest value. Because you will lie to protect your highest value. Or your highest value will ask you to lie. The first of these lies for reasons why people lie is for self-interest. I will choose myself above you. I will choose myself above the situation. I will choose myself above the organization. I will choose myself and I will constantly ask myself what is in it for me. And then I will lie in order that my self-interest be served. Do you know of instances where people acted solely out of self-interest? Yes. We can find it in ourselves. We even find it as the pervasive element in some people's character that they only live to serve themselves. The science call them narcissists. Then, people lie for instant gratification. That's the classic ESO lie. For something I want now, I will lie. For love, I will lie. For money, I will lie. And I think I can handle the consequences later on. The third reason why people lie is to avoid punishment. By the way, this is one of the interesting facts about the disciples. They could have lied about the resurrection of Christ. They could have lied about the gospel and then simply avoided the punishment, uh, avoided being martyred. But they didn't. They kept to the story that Jesus Christ rose again and accepted the punishment and in the sense of Paul almost wished for it in order to be present with the living Christ. In general though, people lie to avoid punishment. Then people lie to win some sense of achievement, to make their deeds better than they actually were. And then people lie to impress others. Just think for a moment that you wanting to impress everybody is your God. How that governs your actions, how that governs your thought, and how that governs your emotions. Lies doesn't have to be big. Even a small lie becomes part of your philosophy. Because it's part of your philosophy, it becomes part of your actions. And because it's part of your actions, this lie that is not related to reality becomes your future. And that means that your future is set to fail because it is not built on reality. If you must replace all those reasons why people lie with what will you replace them i think you can replace them with a character of trust trust that if you serve the interest of the kingdom of god it will work out good for you even if the immediate circumstances is more difficult trust that if you save your money and don't spend it on instant gratification, you will have a better future. Trust that punishment and ultimate uh, punishment and ultimate accountability to your actions will be good. Trust that your achievements are real and they are yours. Trust that you live before God and not before people. You see, a character needs trust. Trust comes first, mindset second, and actions third. And in this way, you will create a future that is built on the positive character. Decision number two. I will choose knowledge. 
Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? Imagine that you are driving down a country road, very excited. You are going on the adventure for life, and you are going to change the world for the better. And then all of a sudden, you just crash and burn over a cliff. I know there should have been a road sign, but there isn't, because the world is not perfect yet. That is the folly of setting off after your desires without knowledge. If only you had known the road, if only you had known there wasn't a warning sign, if only you had known. You see, the problem is not with desire. Desire is the way that people interact with reality. It is a very important function. You work your best when you want to do something. Let's experience two days and say, I have a day where I must wake up at six and then I must do this and then I must do this and then I must do this. You are using a different neurological system than when you wake up this morning at six o'clock and say, I want to wake up, then I want to do this, then I want to do that, then I want to do that. And when you work with desire, you use a bigger part of your brain are more creative, more resourceful, and enjoy life much more with a deeper sense of satisfaction. And in this way, you are actually creating much more energy for the next day. You see, God knows the power of desire. That's why, that is why it is part of the Ten Commandments. You need to desire what is good. The warning in the Ten Commandments of Thou shalt not covet is a warning on the strength of desire because desire will always find a way. So if you desire what is wrong, if you desire what is sinful, if you desire what is not good for you or someone else, you will always find a way. But when you desire what it is good, when you desire what God wants, what happens? Then you are realizing the good of the commandments in your life. That is the key to living the commandments. Each one of them, when you desire to keep them, when you want to praise God and live in a relationship with God, when you want to serve God and call on His name, when you want to honor your parents, when you want to respect life, when you want to tell the truth, you see, when you want to do something, you will find a way to do it. Desire is not the problem. Knowledge is. Desire without knowledge is extremely dangerous. We teach our young people that you must want something and that desire is enough for achievement. But that's not true. Let's take an example. Flying a plane. You really desire to fly a plane. Is that enough? Or do you need something more? Or do you need knowledge? Of course you need knowledge. There are four types of knowledge that is important. In framing your desire in such a way that it will be realized. The first type of knowledge, of course, is technical knowledge. Let's stick to the example of you desire to fly a plane. There is technical skills involved. That is why you go on pilot training. That is why there's first someone that is showing you. There is theory, then there is practical, then there is hours with an instructor, then there are your first solo flight, and then there are the building of confidence. In this way, you are learning the technical skills to fly the plane. But that's not all you need. You also need interpersonal skills. Let's say, for instance, that you want to fly the plane, but you want to do it all alone. Where are you going to get the plane from? Who's going to teach you? Who's going to give you the license? You see, for everything that you desire, everything you want to do, there is at least one other person that is either against you or one other person that is in your team and either way you need to 
relate to them in a manner that makes it possible to achieve your desires. For that you need interpersonal skills. You need to learn to communicate. You need to learn to state what you want and to be positive about it. You need to learn to listen. You need to learn to handle conflict. You need to learn these interpersonal skills because they are creating a pathway for your desires. But then there's a third skill that you must have, and that's the intrapersonal skills. That is the way you conduct yourself. With your intrapersonal skills, you motivate yourself. With your intrapersonal skills, it gives you a level of resilience. With your intrapersonal skills, it gives you frustrations. With your intrapersonal skills, it tells you how you manage yourself. Now, these skills function like a three-legged chair where the lowest level of the skill is the one that determines your potential. Let's say, for instance, that I have great interpersonal skills in flying a plane, but I don't have the technical skills to fly the plane. And I will each chat one of you and you say, come with me because I've got this ability because of my great interpersonal skills, but I haven't got the technical skills. It's a recipe for disaster. What I can do will be limited by my technical skills. Or you get these people that have great technical skills, but they have no interpersonal skills. So it's the greatest pilot ever, but you just can't get him to the airport on time. You just can't get him motivated. You just can't get him to do what he needs to do, and he will never get you at your destination on time. Or you've got this great, highly motivated technical pilot with no interpersonal skills. He acts like a complete scoundrel. He's vain. He swears at you. You don't want to fly with that person. So he's going to fly and he's going to fly all by himself. Either way, your potential is limited. But the type of skill that is the least developed. So if you want to grow and release the potential, you need to decide which one of these skills is the one that is the least developed and start developing that. Then the potential from the other two is also released. But that is not the only knowledge that is important. You will also need moral knowledge. And answer this question, is your life aligned with your values? You can only do stuff against your values for a short period of time. And values has got this element, you will always return to them, always re-evaluate them. And then you need to answer a couple of questions in order to create the sense of alignment with what you value. Where will you be in 10 years' time? If I do exactly what I do today and I value exactly what I value today, where will you be in 10 years' time? And then, what will you dream of in 10 years' time? Don't make the mistake of thinking that in 10 years' time I won't dream. Of course you'll dream. Of course you have aspirations. Of course. Then, what changes must you make? If you want a different future, if you want a different life, what changes must you make? And what changes must you make, not just in behavior, but what changes must you make in values that guide your decisions, that guide your actions? Always remember, in life, you always get what you, what you value. If you value to sleep late, you will not be as productive. If you value exercise, you will run and you will be fitter and you will always get what you value. So create value in your own life and you will reap the benefits of that. I will seek wisdom. The one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. See if you can find specific examples from your own life. 
Wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord. Calamity strikes when people lose their fear of the Lord. Think in the days of Noah when he warned them, when he preached, how they laughed and how they turned away from him. And ultimately, they were the ones destroyed. Think on Sarah when she first heard that she would fall pregnant and how she stood behind the door and she laughed. Think on the reaction the, the, the prophets got when they proclaimed the kingdom of God, when they proclaimed the will of God, and then people lost their reverence, and then they acted against the prophets. Think on the reaction to Jesus when he proclaimed the kingdom of God, when he preached the kingdom of God. Think on the reaction when people lose their reverence for God, then it is always a calamity. So wisdom starts with the fear of the God, and that means that is not something theoretical that is the main line to which you make adjustments from what you value what you decide how you think and how you act if you don't create the sense of alignment with the fear of god and doing the will of god what do you think will become of your life and this is what sin does. Sin is like forming calluses on your heart where you can't feel the love of God. You can't feel the will of God and therefore you can't act on it. And then calamity is a necessary ending. Wisdom is also found in community. Never make the mistake of thinking that wisdom is achieved on your own. Wisdom has got this factor that it is knowledge that is lived, it is knowledge that is experienced and it is experienced amongst people. Therefore the journey on wisdom is a journey with fellow believers where one can be challenged with your blind spots where one can be challenged with that part of your character that you don't see and that is not so good where someone that you love within your community can say listen you need to make certain adjustments otherwise you are going to miss and this is something about ourselves we always think that we know ourselves but we don't there's always that part in ourselves that trip us. There's always that part of yourself that we need to outgrow. There's always that part of ourselves and for that we need people around us that shares in the wisdom and in the fear of God. Because wisdom is experiential there's a little bit of growth then there's a contribution that you need to make. Think on this if you don't grow what contribution can you make to your family? What contribution can you make to the congregation? What contribution can you make to your community if you don't grow? If you're making a contribution and you m reach the limit of the contribution, what do you need to do? You need to grow more. You need to grow in your character. You need to grow in your leadership skills. You need to grow in 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 your life and in your mindset so you can increase your value to the people and the community that you are living in. Therefore, if you just grow, you become like the Dead Sea that also just have inputs. But all the inputs in the world doesn't have the result of love. When you grow, you learn something. You need to make the contribution somewhere so that life may start. That is why it's this principle of the Dead Sea. If all growth stops with you, you will ultimately it will ultimately just bring death. But if you pass it on, then you will find life. That is why we are called to make disciples because the gospel is not supposed to stop with you. That's why we are called servants in the kingdom of God because we serve first and then we are supposed to make other servant leaders.
growth and contribution work hand in hand. And then, wisdom is found being connected to something bigger than myself. One of the biggest mistakes people make is to think that their life is about their choices and what they want from it. Your life is a connection with God and a connection with the kingdom of God to serve His purposes. And that is where you find meaning. That is where you find your place. That is where you find your gifts. Is within the kingdom of God. And He is called you to be a servant leader and to make a servant leader. The three decisions you need to make from Proverbs 19 the most important one is I will seek wisdom in the fear of the Lord.